Now that we've been introduced to the issue in a broad way, it's time to look at the biblical evidence and see uh, whether there are grounds to support this challenging view. And so I've listed them, at least the key pieces of information, somewhat, I think, in the order of importance. And the first piece of evidence is this. If you believe that Romans 7 describes the life of a believer, of a Christian, you ought to recognize that that opens a door that Paul contradicts himself with what he says earlier, one chapter, chapter 6, and what he'll say one chapter later in chapter 8. I've put in the, in the text the, the key verses. There are more verses that are relevant, but these are especially the five verses where potentially the idea of contradiction comes sharpest to the focus. So, so the blue statements capture the idea of being free from sin, whereas in chapter 7, the two statements in red talk about being a slave to sin. So we read in 6.18, for example, having been set free from sin, you became slaves to righteousness. So set free is a strong verb, and Paul says apparently you were slaves to one thing beforehand, you were slaves to sin, but now you're freed. And now you become a slave to something else, namely to righteousness. And 6.22 says exactly the same thing. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves, not to righteousness now, but to God. Now, if you look at 7.14, that looks like that contradicts what Paul just said one chapter earlier. He says, I am fleshly, sold as a slave to sin. And again, 7.23, making me a captive or making me a prisoner to the law of sin. And you say, well, what is it, Paul? Right? You just finished saying two times in chapter 6 we've been set free, and now you're saying that you're a captive, that you're a prisoner. And of course, one chapter ahead, 8-2 is a wonderful verse. Paul says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set me, or you, free from the law of sin and death. And so, if you believe, again, that chapter 7 describes a normal or a Christian experience, that potentially leads to a contradiction with what Paul says both earlier, one chapter beforehand, and later, one chapter afterwards. Douglas Moo especially finds this point important. He says, decisive for me are two sets of contrast. And in this quote, by the way, he cites exactly the same five verses that I've just highlighted for you in the previous PowerPoint slide. And he says that these verses, these contrasts are decisive for him in this debate. The first, he says, the first contrast is between the description of the ego as one sold under sin, that's 714b, and Paul's assertion that the believer, every believer, has been set free from sin, 618 and 622. And the second contrast is that between the state of the ego, quote, imprisoned by the law, or the power of sin, that's 723, and the believer who's been set free from the law of sin and death, that's 8, chapter 2. Each of these expressions depicts an objective status, and it is difficult... He doesn't say it's impossible, but he says, and there's some scholars who argue that it is possible, but he, he, he stresses it is difficult to see how these texts can all be applied to the same per person in the same spiritual condition without doing violence to Paul's language. And so the first evidence is the danger or the possibility of contradiction within Paul's statements in the surrounding chapters. The second piece of evidence is also very important, and that is you need to see that Paul uses 7.5 and 7.6, those two verses, as a kind of literary heading for what is to come. We've talked uh, a number of times in this course about how Paul is a skilled letter writer and how we have to have eyes to see. We have to be the alert readers, not the sleepy readers who miss all of these things. But we have to be sensitive to the skill with which Paul writes, looking not just at what he says, but how he says it. And I put a map quest here in the image because it's kind of like, well, well, where are we going in this sermon, Paul? It's a long sermon here in Romans, and, and where are you taking us? And, and Paul foreshadows the structure of what he's about to say. He foreshadows where he's going to take his readers in verses 7 and 5. So 7-5 describes the past life, 
a life characterized by life under the law. That's the unregenerate, the non-Christian experience. And then in 6, 7, 6, he has a contrast of the Christian life characterized by the term spirit. And then having foreshadowed in these two verses, these two different dynamics, one the unregenerate, the other the regenerate, in other words, the the non-Christian and the Christian experience, then he fleshes it out, he fills out that in a fuller way in the following verses. So that would lead you to expect that chapter 7, 7 to 25 would then elaborate on that past life under the law, and then following that, 8, 1 to 17, he would elaborate the second aspect, that of 7, 6, namely the current present life under the Spirit. I visually represented this uh, here in the next slide and also included the text from those verses so you can hopefully better see and appreciate the force of this uh, second evidence. So 7.5 reads, quote, While we were, this is past tense, while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in the members to bear fruit for death. So that's the past life. life under the law, characterized by sarx is the Greek term. And then Paul follows the arrow, he fleshes it out then in 7, 7 to 25. And then notice 7, 6, the but now. Paul is indicating a rather dramatic shift. He says, now we have a different reality. And now we're discharged, or we're freed from the law, dead to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. And that new life of the Spirit is then elaborated in chapter 8, 1 to 17. There's a literary connection, some lexical, that is verbal links, that strengthen that this heading is indeed intended by Paul. So, for example, on the next slide, you can see that 7, 5, the key term is the Greek word sarx. And it's not surprising then that 7, 14 which is a new beginning within the 7, 7 to 25 section, that it also has the key term sarx, as Paul says in 7.14, that introduction, I am fleshly. And then 7.6 begins with the but now. In Greek, it's the nun. We'll say more about that in a few moments. But that marks a shift to the new reality. And that's exactly e echoed in 8.1. Paul begins 8.1 by saying, so there is now in Greek, nun, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And 7.6 also introduces a key word. If the key word of the old life, 7.5, is sarx, flesh, the key word of 7.6, the new life, is spirit. And it's not surprising then that chapter 8, 1 to 17 has 16 references to the work and presence of the Spirit. And so the second evidence has to do with Paul telegraphing, signaling this, this two-phase discussion, right? 7, 5, foreshadowing uh, explanation of life under the law, under the power of the sarks, the flesh. That's the previous non-Christian life. And then 7.6 giving you the contrast, the but now life, life characterized by the Spirit, fleshed out. I can't say that if I'm talking about the Spirit. That would be filled out by the Spirit, 8.1 to 17. Now mentioning the Spirit leads then to a third important piece of evidence, and that are references to the Spirit. Paul in 7, 5 and 7, 6 characterizes life by the Spirit, seven, uh, the Christian life, 7, 6, as life by the Spirit. And Paul says exactly the same thing in chapter 8, verse 4. Paul will say, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be filled in us. Why? Because we walk not according to the sarks, the flesh, the sinful nature, but we walk according to the Spirit. Right? Christians walk, that is, they live according to the presence and power of the Spirit. The Christian life is a Spirit-filled, a Spirit-led life. Paul says exactly that to the Romans a couple of verses later. In chapter 8, verse 9, he says, But you Romans, right, are not in the sarks. You're not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit. And when you go to Paul's letters elsewhere, he always characterizes the Christian life as a life lived under and by the presence and power of the Spirit. That's the way Paul thinks. That's his theological worldview. Well, if you know that, then it is striking, it is very significant that 
in Romans 7, 7 to 25, there are zero references to the work or presence of the Holy Spirit. And yet in chapter 8, 1 to 17, there are 16. In fact, there are more references to the Holy Spirit in chapter 8 than there are anywhere in Paul's writings, even 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14, those gifts of the Holy Spirit chapters in that letter. And so a, a third piece of powerful evidence or the, the, the reason that Paul is not describing a Christian life in chapter 7 is because there are no references to the presence and working in the Spirit in 7, 7 to 25. A fourth piece of important evidence is the degree of sin's power in chapter 7. It's one thing to say that Christians struggle with sin, and Paul agrees with that. There are texts where Paul acknowledges that Christians struggle with sin. It's another, though, to say that Paul uh, is arguing or to talk about being defeated by sin. Look at these texts from, from chapter 7. I am sold as a slave to sin. 7.18 I know that nothing good lives within me. 7.23 Making me a captive, right, a prisoner to the law of sin. 7.24 What a wretched man I am. 7.25 With my flesh I am a slave to the law of sin. If you want an analogy or an image, the person in Romans 7 isn't a soldier, right, with the armor, duking it out with sin, battling with sin. No, the person in Romans 7 is a prisoner. They're captive. They're helpless. Hear Mu on this particular point. He says, quote, While Paul makes it clear that believers will continue to struggle with sin, and he gives some text where that's the case. What is depicted in 7.14 to 25 is not just a struggle with sin, but a defeat by sin. This is a more negative view of the Christian life than can be accommodated within Paul's theology. A fifth piece of evidence is the sharp contrast that emerges between the person described in chapter 7 and the person described in chapter 8. In chapter 7 it's a pretty negative, a pretty pessimistic picture. Again, I am fleshly, sold as a slave to sin. I do, I do the very thing I hate to do. I know that nothing good dwells within me. The evil I do, uh, do uh, the evil I do not want to do, I do, making me a captive to the law of sin. Wretched person that I am. Remember when we first heard that text at the beginning of this uh, presentation, um, I said to you the words, you know, thanks be to God, right? Or the word of the Lord doesn't automatically or easily come to our lips when we hear this dark picture that is presented. But then when you get to chapter 8, well then, that's a whole other story, right? Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you or me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, God did by the sending Jesus in the likeness of man as a sin offering, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be met in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I mean, that's a text that we can identify with. That's a text that we can say amen to. And so, to look at these two chapters, and to read chapter 7, and then read chapter 8, and say, you know, uh, it's describing the same person, or the same situation, right? Or I could say it this way, as I do in the PowerPoint note. The contrast between chapter 7 and chapter 8 is so dramatic that it is very hard to believe. It's possible, I suppose, to believe. But it's hard to believe that both chapters describe the Christian experience. The sixth and final piece of evidence is something we briefly alluded to, but I want to flesh out or highlight in a more uh, explicit way. And that is the little word nun, which in Greek means now. And in Paul's writings in general, and especially in the surrounding chapters here in Romans, nun is, well, nun marks a contrast. A contrast between an old way of life right, a non-Christian way of life, and then now, well, that's the current Christian life. 
So for example, in, in chapter 5, 8b to 9, we read this. While we were still sinners, right? That's the old life. Apart from Jesus, Christ died for us. And then he says, since we have now been justified by his blood. So the word now signals we're in a different situation, a new reality. Same thing in 619b. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wick wickedness, that's obviously what they did before they became Christians, right? Now offer them in a different way, in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. Again, you see how the now describes the new life of the believer in contrast to the old life of the non or unbeliever. 621, what benefit did you reach, reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? So you did things in the past, right, that you weren't ashamed of. That's part of your old, former, non-Christian life. Now, when you remember about them, you're ashamed about it. The word now introduces or signals this new Christian reality. 622, but now you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. And then 7.6 is especially important. Why? Because remember, 7.5 and 7.6 are those literary headings. 7.5, introducing the old life, life under the law, life characterized by the flesh, the non-Christian, unregenerate life. And then 7.6, the but now, characterizing the new life, right? The life by the infusing, transforming presence of the Spirit. And so since the now in 7.6 marked the shift from the non-Christian to the Christian life, it's fair to see in chapter 8, verse 1, the same thing happening. So before 8, chapter 7, that was the old life, the non-Christian life. 8.1, the now introduces the new life, life under the Spirit, life as a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, there are, of course, objections. Uh, remember, this is not a slam dunk, uh, uh, an open and shut case. There is another side. It's not for nothing that the other view, the so-called traditional view, was indeed uh, the popular view for a long time in reform circles and elsewhere. And so there are some objections that we ought to take up and respond to. So the first objection is, I think, an easy one to answer. The objection is, what about the clearly Christian statement in chapter 7, verse 25a? Right in the middle of all that rather depressing language about not being able to do the good that you want to do and being a captive and sold to sin, there was this, this uh, breath of fresh air, right, where Paul says, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And many people will read that and say, well, you know, a non-Christian could never say that. Only a Christian could. And remember, that's why I stress that, that, the, that my position, right, is that Paul is describing the unregenerate or the non-Christian, but viewed through Christian eyes. Right? Paul is writing this as a believer, and it's almost as if Paul is so down or depressed by all of the negative things characterizing the life apart from Christ that he can't help himself. It's like he, he foreshadows, he blurbs out. He can't wait to finish off this train of thought without saying, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because he knows that's not the end of the story. He knows that there, there is deliverance from the power of Satan, sin, and death. And so that's why I want to stress again that chapter 7 describes the non-Christian or pre-Christian experience, but viewed through Christian eyes. A second objection goes like this. What about the seemingly Christian statement of 722? Now I say seemingly Christian because in 722 we read, In my inner being I delight in God's law. And one way to hear that is, oh, that must be a, a, a Christian saying that. Uh, only a Christian would say they delight in God's law. Although there actually are some other options. So option one to respond to this second objection is this. If you look at 723, so you have to look at this at the context of 722, when Paul says, in my inner being, he uses the word noose or mind. And so Paul is highlighting the rationale, the reasoning part. And I think that uh, one, can, I, one can say that it's theoretically possible that, that either a pious Jew or maybe even a pious 
non-Jew, a Gentile, in their mind would want to do what is good, would want to live a life that is, so to say, in Paul's words, in agreement with God's law, right? In theory, even unbelievers, if you ask them, you want to do bad things or good things, they say, oh, in my mind, right, they, they have a desire to do that which is good. And so one way to treat this statement is to say that Paul is projecting the, the idea of common humanity, right, in their mind, in an abstract way, you know, to do good, even though they can't live that out. But a second option, and maybe this is more convincing to you, is that Paul is speaking as a representative not of, com, uh, of a common person in general, but of a common Jew. Because Jews especially could say that they delight in God's law. There are Psalms, right, that speak about how I love your law, O Lord. And Paul acknowledges that the Jews have this kind of passion for God and for his law. Paul says in chapter 10 of Romans, verse 2, I bear witness that they, that is, the people of Israel, his fellow uh, his fellow compatriots, right, have a zeal for God. And so Paul, when he says, in my inner being, that could either be Paul as a Jew speaking, or it could be Paul as a representative Jew, right? Highlighting what Jews in common might say. And so this objection doesn't, I believe, throw a wrench into the challenging view. It doesn't make the challenging view an impossible one. The third objection, I think, is the strongest. In fact, I'm sure it's the strongest of the objections that I've raised because if you read uh, a proponent of the traditional view they'll usually cite this first and it has to do with the change of tense in chapter 7 so chapter 7 from verse 7 to 25 falls into two subparts if you will the first subpart that is 7 verses 7 to 13 all make use of the past tense, both the aorist and the imperfect. And then the following verses, 7, 14 to 25, the verbs are all consistently in the present tense. And if you're a traditional person, you would say, well, that makes sense. 7, 7 to 13, those past verbs, those past tenses, that's where Paul is describing his old life, right? His non-Christian life, his life within Judaism. But then in 14 he moves to the present tense. Why? Because now he's describing his current status, his current state as a Christian. So what can we say about that? Well one option, and I admit right off the bat that it's not the most persuasive, though some have argued this, one option is to talk about the present tense as an historic past. All right? This is a grammatical uh, phenomenon that is true, although it's more true in the Gospels than in Paul, where writers will use the present tense when they're describing the past. Why? In order to make that uh, event more vivid or significant. And so some have argued that Paul shifts to the present tense in 7.14 to 25, not because he's talking about the present time so much as he's trying to make more vivid, more dramatic, uh, his or the representative view of the pre or non-Christian life. But that's not so convincing to me because Paul uh, doesn't make use of the historic present as common as some of the gospel writers do. And so I'm more persuaded by this second explanation and that is that the present tense was used by Paul. So he, he changes from the past tense verses 7 to 7, 13 to the present tense, verses 14 to 25, because he's highlighting the, the condition of, uh, of humanity outside of Christ. He's highlighting the ongoing or continuous nature of what it means to be living according to the flesh and by which one is enslaved to the law. So Schreiner, for instance, is an important Roman commentator who says, quote, The state of the person who is a slave to sin is communicated most effectively through present tense verbs. And that, that seems to me right. However, uh, if, you, if you have a slightly different view on the I question, remember we separate the I question from the whoever the I is, whether it's a pre-Christian or a Christian experience, if you, as many scholars argue, that, that the representative or rhetorical I is meant to portray Israel as a nation, 
There's another way to look at this, and that is chapter 7, verses 7 to 13, those past tenses, will describe Israel as a nation before they had the law. Right? Israel existed as a nation for a while without the law. Right? Before Sinai, before God revealed to them the law, they existed for a period of time. And that, so the argument goes, is being described in chapter 7, 7 to 13. And then when Paul shifts to the present tense, then he's saying, okay, once Israel as a nation got the law, and that still describes Israel today. But again, it's not describing Christians. It's not describing the church. It's describing uh, Jews in the present time, or to put it differently, it's describing again a non-Christian experience. Well, perhaps you're overwhelmed with all of these evidences and these objections and these counter-arguments to the objections. And maybe you're asking yourself the so what question, right? Or what's the take home? And this is where I want to highlight for you what I said at the very beginning. Even though this is a, an important theological issue over which the church has debated and, and quite heatedly and uh, for a long period of time, it has very pastoral, very pragmatic implications. And I want to spell those out for you now. So I've got three dangers for the traditional view. And then I have one danger for my own challenging view, right? So three dangers for the traditional view and one danger for the challenging view. Danger number one of the traditional view. You have to be careful that if you believe that Romans 7 describes the Christian life, if you believe that Paul is speaking there as a believer, he's describing the ongoing presence and power of sin in a believer's life, you have to be careful that you don't undermine the redemptive work of Christ. You have to be careful that you don't run out and from the pulpit say, Jesus saves, and then you have to have a huge asterisk like I put on my PowerPoint over there. You have to have somebody in the side say, or maybe at the end of the sermon you have to have this little, this little uh, warning, this little caveat, you know, this, this, this announcer comes on and says, warning, sin may still have so much power in your life that you will not be able to do the good that you want to do. Or another way to say it is, did Jesus' death and resurrection accomplish something or not? Did he win the victory over Satan, sin, and death, or not? Right? You have to be careful that you don't ascribe so much ongoing and current power to sin that you take away the redemptive work of Christ. That's the first danger. The second danger, and this is a big one, I think, and that it that Romans 7, if you think it describes the Christian life, can give you or others an easy excuse for sin. This happens a lot, I believe. Um, uh, people look at their life, and, and most of us do some self-reflection. Most of us, if I said to you, you know, uh, what are the sins in your life? What are the ongoing issues? What things in your life, you know, are happening that you know aren't in keeping with, you know, the will of God? And, and most of us have done that already, right? We've done that mentally, and so it wouldn't take long to do it again because we've done it before. But we probably say to ourselves, we kind of do that inventory, and then we, we what? We, we, we say things like, well, the things that I'm not doing right are actually kind of small compared to the things I am doing right. And the things I'm not doing right are certainly a lot smaller than the things that so many people around me are not doing right. In other words, we compare ourselves to others, and we, and we try to justify or downplay our sins. And then maybe we go one step further and say something like, maybe not out loud, but in our minds, you know, God can't expect too much from me, you know. I mean, hey, Paul couldn't do, I'm no Paul. I mean, you know, yes, I mean, I, I see evidence of God's grace in my life, and I think I'm a pretty good person, but I'm no, I'm no saint. I'm no great apostle like Paul, and, and if Paul couldn't do the good that he wanted to do, well then, how can God expect me, you know, to do the good that I want to do? And so I'm, I, I'm worried that Christians are far too complacent or far too comfortable about sin in their life, and they use Romans 7 as a way to justify that. I don't know if this is uh, helpful or not. I found it a bit humorous. Here on our campus at uh, Calvin Seminary and Calvin College, there was an email a while back from the, the people in the health area at the college, and um, they wanted to kind of challenge people to exercise, and, and, the, and the email announcement started off like this. It said, like Paul, we often don't do that which we want to do. 
And the idea is, you know, that everybody has a desire to exercise and to be fit, but yet we don't deliver on that. And I found it striking that even though they didn't quote Romans 7, they clearly were alluding to Romans 7. They were using Romans 7 as a way to say, oh, wait a minute, many of us justify our non-exercise by saying we just, wait, we can't do the good that we want to do. The catechism might support that if you don't read it all the way. Now, you could misuse the catechism on this, right? The catechism in Lord's Day 44, question and answer 114 says, But can those converted to God obey these commandments perfectly? And then comes the answer that, that maybe you like, right? The answer is no, right? In this life, even the holiest have only a small beginning of disobedience. And maybe people go, phew, you see? No, no wonder I can't live a perfect life. Or, you know, I'm not so bad after all because, hey, even the holiest in this life have only the smallest beginning. But I find it interesting, again, that the catechism doesn't stop here. Like we did earlier with the previous question and answer, it continues. It says, nevertheless, with all seriousness and purpose, they do begin to live according to all, not just some, of God's commandments. A while ago, uh, someone was asked in an interview, it had to do with sanctification, right, holiness in their life, and, and, and this person was asked, now, let's imagine that the road of sanctification is a thousand miles long, and, and where would you put yourself on that? Are you at the very beginning, are you in the middle, or the end? And this person, I thought, too easily or too quickly put themselves at the very, very beginning. And... Um, I don't know about you, but when I look at my life, I, I don't see it that way. I mean, when I compare my life beforehand, before I became a professing believer, one who acknowledged Jesus Christ in my life, I think I made a lot of huge changes in my life. And if you don't believe so, well, you can visit my hometown of Brockville. You can track down my old high school buddies, and, and they'll tell you about how Lima got religious on them. And they might be surprised, because they probably don't even know, not just that I'm a Christian, but, but that I'm a seminary professor. And isn't that the way it isn't it that the way it is for you too? I mean, can't you look at your life and see how grace has changed you, transformed you, or do you kind of say, you know, I'm only on mile one, and I, you know, I barely made a beginning. Now, of course, I grant you there's a counter argument. You might say, well, I've made all of these changes, I've made some dramatic changes, but but actually. I've moved far down the road of sanctification, but the farther I move down the road of sanctification, the farther the end seems, because the more holy I become, the more acutely I, aware I am of God's demand for holiness and my inability to meet those demands. And so there's something to be said for that too. But I, but I worry about this danger of using Romans 7 thinking that it describes a non that it describes a Christian experience as an easy excuse for sin. And I know I'm not alone because Douglas Moo, in one of his other commentaries, uh, says this. And so let's hear what he has to say on that. He says, Whatever our view of Romans 7 might be, then, we need to avoid what I think all interpreters would agree is a misuse of the text, using it to justify sin or stagnation in the Christian life. I have all too often encountered believers with just this attitude, quote, I'm really struggling with a sin, and it keeps getting the best of me, but that's all right. Paul had the same problem. Well, there's a third danger I want to alert you of, and that's this. Be careful that you don't use Romans 7 to create in you a pessimistic or an overly pessimistic view or attitude in our struggle with sin. As you think about your ongoing battle with, and I don't know whatever sin it might be, can you have hope in that battle or not? Or, or are you kind of already planning or planting the seeds for defeat, saying, you know, you know, I, I, I probably won't overcome it. And, and what are you going to say to people who come to you for pastoral care? People are going to come to you and they're going to share in a very personal and painful way the presence of sin in your life. And what are you going to say to them? Can you offer them a word of hope? Is there victory in Jesus? Is what Paul says in Romans 8, 2 true? For the, spirit, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Can you say that with full conviction to people you're ministering to? Or, or do you have to, in the interest of full disclosure, give them that little warning clause? You know, watch out. You know, sin may still be so powerful in your life that you may well not be over to, to overcome this sin and be holy as God has called you to be holy.
Now, these are three dangers with the traditional view. I also recognize that there is a danger with my challenging view. So if I push victory over sin to such a great degree, then you might go so far as to advocate or to push for what has been called perfectionism, the idea that Christians can and must live a perfect life. And if you stress this holiness, this possibility of living a holy life, a perfect life so much, then the danger is a Christian may look and see sin in their life and then, well, may well, wait, let's say, wait a minute, sin's not supposed to be in Christian's life, I have sin in my life, then I wonder whether or not I'm actually a believer. I worry whether my faith is genuine. I, I'm afraid or I'm fearful whether God's grace is indeed operative in my life. And that, of course, is not a healthy pastoral situation either. Well, by way of conclusion, the issue of the identity of I in Romans 7 uh, will continue to be a big debate. And my purpose isn't really to convince you of the challenge, uh, challenging position. No, my goal is much more modest than that. I want you to be aware that there is a debate. Right? My experience has been is that many, even seminary students, aren't aware of an alternate interpretation for Romans 7. But even if you don't change your mind, right? even if you're aware of the challenging view and you don't find the biblical evidence compelling, I at least want to first of all challenge you to watch out for any view of Romans 7, especially the traditional view of Romans 7, that what? That is guilty of those three dangers that I've just enumerated. Namely, a review of Romans 7 that undermines the salvific work of Christ, that provides an easy excuse for sin, or creates a pessimistic or overly negative attitude in our struggle with sin. And the second thing I want to challenge you is this. Even if you believe that Romans 7 describes the Christian life, even if you had and you still have the traditional reform view on this particular text, Romans 8 is still in the Bible. Right? Romans 8 is still in the text. And if I have a chance to describe for someone else what the normal Christian life looks like. If somebody says to me, you know, uh, what is the hope of the gospel? Or, or uh, what does a typical or a normal or normative believer's life look like? I'm not going to take them to Romans 7. I want to take them to Romans 8. Because Romans 8 has the good news that we ought to hold out for us. That there is then now, right, in Christ Jesus, no condemnation. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set you free from the law of sin and death in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Or to put it this way, there's no more excuse for sloppy Christian living. Believers are not doomed to perpetual failure. But God has given us power by the Spirit a power that is greater than the power of sin, that is the fleshly nature, and how the fleshly nature and sin works with the law. We have been set free from the law of sin and death, and life under the Spirit is a victorious life. And this is an old hymn, but it's, a, it's an oldie but a goodie for this passage. O victory in Jesus, my Savior forever! He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. And so, dear friends, look to Romans 8 and celebrate and embrace and proclaim and by the Spirit's help live in the victory over sin that is ours in Christ Jesus.